have until 10 o'clock, right? Hello, hello. Until uh, 10 o'clock, guys. <coughs> and did anybody, Jacques, did you find out about the checkout time? Is that really at 10 o'clock? 10 o'clock. Okay. So I will not be, uh, well, I should check out at 10 o'clock too, I guess, but uh, I won't be. Finish. What's that? 10 o'clock. Yes, exactly. Uh, I won't be offended if people need to run and uh, pack up their bags and then <laughs> bring and check out. Uh, they, should, they should pay with us at 10. Yes, exactly. We'll hide the penguins yeah. too, just to make sure. <laughs> All right. Uh, the title of our session today is Leadership Lessons Learned from a 100% volunteer-led project. So if you were here in the, for the, you know, the coding lessons that you're expecting, you might be in the wrong room. This won't be about coding. This will be about, you know, the human interactions and relationships and management that we have in the visual community. Nobody's leaving. Okay, that's good. Not yet. Not yet. Don't worry. I've only got... <laughs> you know, you get a clicker and you think it would actually work. Uh, one more. All right, we might be going old school style. Oh, there it is, all right. Good morning, J&B On. Good morning. Thank you, it's the last day of J&B On. That's sad. Uh, but it's nine in the morning, and I can't believe that there's more than my fellow OSM board members here today. So thank you guys for being interested in what I have to say and talking about some of the lessons learned uh, that I've had from the Joomla leadership um, and just giving an opportunity to kind of uh, share some of this information with you all. And most importantly, I want to take time for a good part of the last third of the session to just take some questions from you guys. We have other leaders in our community here today as well. Uh, so I'm not going to cover everything. <clears throat> and I'm probably not going to get uh, in my presentation to all of the burning questions you might have. So. As you see this go through, please feel free to hit me with the hardest questions uh, you've got. I'm happy to answer them or find really good ways to avoid answering them, but hopefully the first part. Uh, okay, so 100 slides, that's our target. Uh, it's going to be pretty quick. That's about 3.3 slides per second. Uh, I won't second. say Whoa. Or per minute, not per second. That would be awesome. Uh, but per minute. Uh, exactly. Uh, so we're going to move through this uh, pretty quickly, especially because we're running a little late. So, um, yep, so I'm the president of OSM. I uh, drive in fancy OSM cars. I fly fancy OSM planes. Um, but most importantly for you all here, uh, I get to tell you all the secrets of what happens in OSM world and in Juno leadership world. Uh, and unfortunately, there aren't enough good secrets to keep you in here for 45 minutes, so I'm going to have to just tell you the way things are. Not many of them are secrets, but hopefully I can communicate them in a way that makes sense and is understandable. Uh, so what I really want to do today is to continue to find ways to pull back a curtain, either a perceived curtain or a real curtain, between what happens in leadership and what the community knows about that. And this should really be an open dialogue rather than just me talking at you guys today, to make sure that we're getting that curtain pulled further and further back uh, as much as possible. All right, so uh, first, uh, just a, a slight change of plans. Um, yesterday and the day before and the day before that, I had uh, an opportunity to have a ton of good conversations. I know that uh, Phil, Jacques, Andy, and others here from the leadership uh, have had wonderful conversations with folks. I changed some of my presentation late last night. I was up to about 5.30, 5 o'clock in the morning uh, because there are some good uh, topics that came up that I wanted to make sure that while we're here together uh, at JM Beyond that we were able to discuss them as well. Um, so one of them is I was really expecting this year uh, at JM Beyond to be the year that I was able to um, answer uh, more questions, new questions, and tell you guys uh, a vision of exactly where we're going with 100% accuracy and give clear knowledge as to uh, what's going on uh, for the future moving forward. Uh, and what I've been learning is that really the listening tour that I did last year at JMB Beyond and all the event travel I've been doing for the course of the last year has shown me that more listening needs to happen. There's still uh, concerns, ideas, 
and ways that people want to get involved that I'm still wanting to take time to listen to and to provide you feedback with. Uh, I don't think I'm in the position right now to say, I've heard everything that you needed to say, uh, I'm here to give you all of the answers. So I hope to let you, I hope that you understand that it's the continuing dialogue and the more I've had a chance to talk to people here at Jane Beyond, I recognize that this is more dialogue, more listening, and more hopefully being able to drive as a community towards the right answers. So uh, this is uh, my sister, uh, Jamie. She goes to UC Santa Barbara. Uh, and I want to tell you a little something about the next generation of folks coming through uh, our world, especially coming into the Joomla community. Um, the short story is this. I, I had a chance as a good big brother uh, to go visit her at university uh, about four months ago or so. I mean, it's Santa Barbara. Of course I'm going to go visit her. It's great. And uh, we were walking around and being the good big brother nerd that I am, I asked her some technology questions just to get a feel like, you know, what's the word on the street? What are the kids doing these days in college? Uh, so I asked her silly questions and uh, a couple of the questions were something like this. I asked her, uh, James, so, so what are you guys using for email these days? Are you using those uh, University of California email addresses? You're probably sticking with Gmail. <clears throat> or goodness gracious, maybe you have that old AOL account that we had. And she said, oh, no, 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 we don't use email. We use Facebook. I'm like, oh, OK, that's, that's interesting. Uh, OK, so what happens when uh, you're, you're sharing photos, you do some weekend event with your friends, you're posting your photos online, you're sharing them, and you're commenting on them, but you must use like Flickr or Casa, or who knows what. Uh, well, no, we're, we actually use Facebook. All right, cool, uh, that's interesting. So I know you're in a sorority, Jamie. You guys plan events all the time. You're doing fundraisers, you're having parties. You know, what do you use to organize this? Well, we use a calendar on Facebook. Okay, okay, great. Jason, this sounds a little crazy here, but like, what happens when you want to send a mass communication? You want to hit as many people as possible, all of your friends, everybody at the university, with an email, an actual email, you know, with an at sign in it. What do you use then? All of my friends are on Facebook. I don't use anything other than Facebook, Ryan. These questions <laughs> are getting boring. Um, the reality of life in the cloud, the reality that the next generation is looking for the easiest tools possible, and that they're not the same tools we've been using for the last 40 years, should give us pause, especially anybody here over the age of 18. The next generation is bringing new tools and new expectations to the workforce, and importantly for us, open source projects. So I know we talk a lot about the different tools we have. Let's just keep this in mind as we're moving forward because the next generation of folks uh, is not going to be using the same tools that we're using. In fact, a good example of this is, anybody heard of Salesforce.com? CRM tool? Um, Salesforce.com made a big release about a year or two ago. And one of the major changes they've introduced is something called Chatter. And Chatter is uh, real-time collaboration through almost something that looks identically to a Facebook wall. So that you can go ahead and post inside your company like what's going on with status updates and links to documents and all these sorts of things. Uh, that new generation of, uh, of, uh, of workers is coming with that expectation that things are in the cloud, I don't have to use email to communicate with folks, we're gonna organize collaborative, collaboratively online with tools that are just there <coughs> ready for me to, to use them. So what's all this mean as we're coming into the next generation of open source? And what's it mean for leadership? What, what should we be doing to make sure that we've got the right tools ready for the next generation, as well as making sure we're finding ways to, to motivate them to be successful and to help us out as we're growing our projects? So what I want to do is just take a moment to kind of dive into some of the weird stuff that, uh, that I've been learning about. I know others have been hearing about this as well. Uh, when it comes to motivating people to get stuff done. Uh, and people here have heard of carrots and sticks, right? You know, to, to motivate folks to get things done, you either whip them into shape to make sure that they're doing the job well, or you provide them some sort of uh, enticing uh, goal, reward, the carrot, for doing that work. You drive them closer and closer to that goal with, with that carrot. So, is that really working? And is that really what happens in 
open source projects like ours. <clears throat> to find that out, uh, a small college, a small university called MIT, uh, did some work with a very small banking system called the US Federal Reserve to learn more about this, to see what it is that exactly is motivating folks in 2010 and beyond. Their findings are pretty surprising. First of all, they did find that carrots and sticks, the, the traditional ways of motivating folks to move forward, does work. Especially works when you've got some really rudimentary skill, oh, especially works when you've got rudimentary skills. You're trying to move object from point A to point B. You're trying to get something built faster than uh, expected. Providing those monetary rewards, providing those carrots does help. But what's really crazy about all this <clears throat> is that when it comes to higher cognitive skills, when it comes to critical thinking skills, the more you pay for that, the worse the results get. At some point, when it comes to something more complex, like let's say building software, the more you pay people to do something, the less successful the results. That seems really weird, especially with, you know, lots of years of economics behind that. What they found though is what's really motivating people to do better, to produce better results, are three key things. <clears throat> First of all, uh, autonomy. The ability for workers and individuals to direct uh, their own life, to determine their own destination, at least to feel like they're in control of where they're going, even if they might be working in your office cubicle to make sure your product gets out the door. Giving them space to do that and making them feel that comfort level of autonomy is critical. Uh, second of all, mastery. All of us have some sort of talent we work on, maybe on the side, maybe it's musicians, maybe you're sports athletes, maybe you've got a couple of crafting hobbies going on. That ability just to be good at something that you're passionate about really gets people motivated to learn more. And finally, some sort of purpose. You know, it's great that you've got this motivation through autonomy. You feel like you can control your own life and that you're able to go ahead and find out how you can be the best at a certain uh, critical skill or task. But if you do that without some sort of purpose as to some sort of reason for that, it's not going to be as motivating or as interesting for an individual to, to get involved. None of these say more money, apply bags of money, and people will just do better and better, especially for difficult things like open source projects. So for us, this should sound pretty familiar. I mean, we're all part of an open source community, uh, and it's going to be rare in projects like Joomla that there's going to be money coming from the skies to just pay for the great work we need to do uh, as a community. And this is what our open source software development is all about. So this isn't necessarily new, but I wanted to make sure we recognize that there are ways in which we can motivate folks. This is going to be founding <clears throat> foundational points for our, our talk going moving forward. So just to get this straight, what we're going to do is we're going to ask extremely bright people, smart folks, innovating for the next generation, that are already very busy with their lives, you know, that are working two laptops at the same time while drinking Diet Coke and being on their Blackberry, uh, and maybe didn't go to bed before 5.30 in the morning, maybe. They're dedicating tons and tons of time to software projects, to open source communities, to leadership. And we're paying them nothing to do this. There's no monetary reward directly from these projects to do this. I'm not a genius. I learn just like you guys do. I'd highly recommend taking a look at this movie and this presentation we put online in case you don't write this link down. But a nice cartoon drawing of the full process and what they learned in the study that MIT and the Federal Reserve did uh, is, is nice and graphically put online. But the critical part of this is that we're doing something that's really different and we're really trying to get people motivated through these very uh, innate, uh, I would say almost primal motivational skills or tasks. So what I think is that we've got to focus on a higher purpose in Joomla. I have my own uh, purpose, my own mission, I'm not going to go into that. Some folks have heard it before, some folks heard it on the lawn. 
But what I think is that people are acting economically, irrationally. They're giving all this free time to a great project because they want to contribute to something bigger than just themselves. It's not just their own little craft. They want to contribute to something that a worldwide community of people are a part of. And that they can feel, which I believe, that we in the Juma community are truly changing the world for the better. So, folks might, oh, uh, yes? Have you tested that completely? Uh, the Juma community that they are feeling that they are contributing to something bigger and changing the world? That's a good, I can ask the question right now. Would be Does uh, who here thinks that uh, by contributing to the Joomla project, you're contributing to changing the world for the better? <clears throat> okay, great. So that was about for those of you watching at home. That was maybe about eighty percent of the people. We still got twenty percent to work on. <clears throat> Thank you for the question. Uh, some people uh, might not be a big fan of Mr. Jobs. I don't think he's the biggest supporter of open source software these days, uh, especially on the iOS platform. Um, but you gotta say, they make pretty cool devices, at least. They make very popular devices, at least. Uh, when people go to work uh, at Apple, they don't say, I'm here to make the next generation of smartphones. Steve and friends say, I'm here to make a dent in the universe when you go to work at Google, you don't walk in every day and say, you know what, I'm here to build a better search engine. Their line is, we're here to solve humanity, humanity's toughest problems. And I'm sure our friends at Microsoft as well, when they go to work every day, they're not there to say, we want to build the next generation of Windows software. We're here to do something very, very, very important. I'm sure, correct? I just don't know what that is. I'll have to change my slide next time. <laughs> Uh, so, we got the world, change the world or go home. <laughs> change the world, go home. Change the world or go home. Change the world or go home. I like that. So my open, uh, my core open source value is, is simple. You've all seen it. My goal is to say this as many times as possible until every one of you knows it. I believe that the relationships we build are more important than the tools themselves. And that having events like Jay and Beyond and having opportunities to meet in person and having opportunities to collaborate together are going to be more important than just the tools we're building because the next generation that's talking about wanting to build the next killer Facebook app, not on Facebook, but in the cloud somewhere with tools we haven't used before and without collaborating using tools we've used in the past, that stuff isn't even here yet and the only way we're going to be able to get there is if we build good channels of communication, that we collaborate well together, and we find ways to continue to build relationships. That's why I believe that most of our OSM board is here. That's why I'm here today, because we really believe that relationships and building those connections with the community is going to be successful moving forward. So I say, nobody in this room is just a consumer of technology, especially open source software. All of us have unique talents. We're more than users, as some of our Swedish friends would say. We're empowered contributors. And this is Jay and Beyond last year. It's nice to be able to come back and show the photo from last Jay and Beyond. This is what happens there. Fun Swedish friends and others. Um, I, I really believe that folks um, don't need to say they're a contributor to Joomla only if they write code. And I think a lot of us here today get that, but know that not a lot of people in the community understand that being a contributor to Joomla is more than just writing code. So please go back to your local user groups, go back to the communities, go back to the online forums, and make sure that we're motivating and empowering people and saying thank you. It doesn't have to be a code contribution to be an important contribution to the project. So I really believe that what we need to do as leaders, and part of what I'll be telling you more about today, is we gotta make sure to give the community the hammers, the nails, the tools necessary to build the next generation of software because there ain't anybody coming down from the mountaintop to do it for you anymore. We gotta do this together. This is a new world, a big paradigm shift in the way we're working and the way leadership needs to communicate that is by coming out here and making sure you understand what we're doing moving forward. So just an overview, for some of you who have never heard of Joomla before, 
I'm going to go through a two slide presentation of the Joomla history, <laughs> uh, talk about some of these lessons learned and some of the pitfalls to avoid, and most importantly at the end here, um, I'm going to take a look at the time, all right, 30 after, great, uh, making sure that we ask lots of questions when you've got leaders in the room to get specific answers. So the long short history of Joomla, some of you know it's a small project, started down there in Australia, something called Mambo. Let's remember that Mambo was essentially an orphan. It was a corporation that had given its software out to the open source community and said, good luck, and left it at the doorstep and said, go, go get them. Go, go do something with this, we're done. Uh, and then of course, a few years later, they started winning a bunch of awards. Uh, and then said company was pretty interested in what happened. Gosh, this open source community did great work. Well, open source community didn't think it was a good time to go back to, uh, to the company and said, you know what, we need to be able to do this together. We had some open source patriots that came together. We had uh, Andrew Eddy and I think 27 others that came together to, uh, I say, write their declaration of independence from Mambo. Uh, and not, soon, uh, not too late after that, be able to get to the era of Joomla in 2005. And from 2005 to today, it's only been about, what, less than six years, five and a half. So first of all, and you can't really see this in the back, these are, these are two seals patting each other on the back here. I want to make sure that we're spending time celebrating success and recognizing what we're doing, because what we're doing is pretty damn awesome. First of all, let's just take a look at some graphs here. Uh, this is updated as of last night, or as of this morning a few hours ago, I should say. Uh, looking at the Joomla forum user uh, community, we have, I believe, almost 500,000 registered users on the international forums. And do people here use something other than the international forums at forum.joomla.org? If you use something else, raise your hand. Great. So there's probably at least half the people in this room here that are using an international forum or other forums. So this is just a small snapshot of the Joomla community. That's 239 new users to our forum community a day. Looking at the kinds of discussions we're having, I mean, you, you get the point. These are going to be charts that go, you know, up and to the right, of course, right? Uh, 24 new forum posts a minute. We're almost at 2.5 million in the last five years, five and a half years, excuse me. Looking at the ecosystem we have with third-party developers, which I'm proud to see continue to grow. Um, we're at a point where we're almost reaching 8,000 extensions on the JDD, the extensions directory. That's 145 new extensions per month. Uh, when I gave uh, this chart last year, it was down, it was at uh, 119 per month, which is still awesome. But 145 new extensions up there every month, reviewed manually by members of our community, is pretty awesome. So, looking at it from a market share perspective, um, folks have heard of things like .NET Nuke. .NET Nuke has about 0.9% of the market of the top 1 million companies or organizations that are using a content management system. So if you're using a content management system and you're one of the top 1 million trafficked websites on the web, 0.9% of you are using .NET Nuke. 1% of you are using Expression 2.4% is typo 3, which I believe is actually really popular here in, in, uh, in Confident. 6% are using Drupal, uh, and 10.6% are using Joomla. And of that, the next bar at the top here, 2.7% of all of the websites they found in the top 1 million, regardless of whether they're using a CMS, are running on Joomla. That's 200. <coughs> That is 2.7% of the top 1 million. One thing to note, though, depending on how you describe uh, a system called WordPress, the blue is Drupal, the red is Joomla, and the big gray bar that goes up to about 55% or so uh, is WordPress. 55% of websites using CMSs in the top 1 million are using WordPress. That's pretty impressive. And I think that's great for a fellow open source uh, project, compatriot uh, in our efforts here. 
What's more interesting is that I wanted to make sure we had this line graph here, which is about the last year. And I've heard people say, Joomla's doing great, we're going huge, we're getting all over the place. And some people said, oh my gosh, Joomla, we're doing so poorly, I, I can just feel it, the world's crumbling. The reality is, Joomla's ranking for the top uh, market share in this top 1 million went down about 0.8% in the last year. Drupal's also went down. 0.8% in the last year. And in fact, of the top five, the only one that I could actually see that made any sort of positive change was WordPress that went up 0.1% in the last year. So this is the reality of market share. There's lots of things that we can feel that are important to us, there's lots of things that we can imagine, uh, that we can, we can think about, but the reality is, is this. We're all pretty much staying and moving at the same pace when it comes to market share. That doesn't mean necessarily innovation or complexity or new ideas uh, are, are changing at different rates. But I just wanted to show this, this graph to you guys so you can recognize it. So we recognize that we're moving 2.7% of the web, that Joomla is a very, very large ship that's been sailing for probably about 9 to 10 years from the Mambo community to the Joomla community, and it's got lots of people on board. But we're also small boats, too. There's new innovations happening in our community from distributions to new ways to be thinking about doing development work that are helping us move forward in sometimes a faster fashion, or a faster fashion. But if we're not going to be paying the next generation of people to be writing this new software, we've got to be focusing on what's motivating them, going back to the autonomy and the mastery and the purpose. And the question is, are we as leaders doing that? And can we look ourselves in the mirror and say, we've done everything we can. I think the answer is, we are doing what we can, but we can be doing a lot more. So, starting with a mission or a vision or values of where you're going, I think is really critical for a project. Uh, and to be clear, for the first three years, from 2005 to 2008, I don't believe, I've looked, I've tried, that the project or Open Source Matters, from which you know, I'm the president of, had a clearly written mission, vision, and values. So when it comes to mastery and purpose and focusing people on a bigger goal that's bigger than themselves, it's tough to do that without a very clear roadmap. But we've got a mission now, and I'm going to skip through these next slides really quickly for the sake of time. Uh, we have a vision of people uh, publishing and collaborating in their own communities around the world, uh, providing software that's free, secure, and of high quality, and a community that's enjoyable and rewarding to participate in. This is something that the leadership team came together and said, this is important to our vision. Rewarding and exciting and enjoyable community to participate in. We have some values from freedom all the way down to usability. Uh, and all of this is, is just at a bit.ly link away from you, a bit.ly uh, slash J mission where it's all documented for the community to see. Uh, helps to bring people together 2008 was the last time we as a leadership got a chance to meet together in person, to talk, to have the great kinds of exchanges that you all are having here today. We're lucky enough to be able to do that uh, again this year in uh, the end of July uh, out in California. And it'll be a great opportunity for us to all come together again. But it's been too long. And we need to meet together more often. We've got to make sure that we're really focused on having these kinds of in-person meetings. Because beer and other things, as we've all learned here over the course of the last two days, are helpful lubricators of moving forward and collaborating together with folks. So there's really two types of leadership in open source projects, right? The first one is going to be the organizational leadership type. This is a company. Uh, I believe Microsoft is producing its, its Orchard, right? Orchard CMS. Is that actually open source? Uh, yes, it is. It's on uh, Autoker Foundation, and it's using our MS Progressive license. Perfect. It's on Codebox too. Perfect. Excellent. Corporations going ahead and, and being able to, uh, to shepherd, to steward, and move forward open source projects. That, that's one. Another one is to have your benevolent dictators, right? Your Drees in the Drupal world, or your Mats in the WordPress world, uh, or Linus <laughs> with his Lego uh, penguin in uh, the Linux world. Having a person that is the one person that's 
been there from the beginning, the founder of the project, and still leading forward on it today. And then you have Joomla, which is this weird, hippie, almost socialist, but really pro-capitalist type of society where people are moving forward as a community, we're producing new stuff, we're producing 2.7% of the web's websites, but we don't have one leader. We don't have a corporation. We don't have venture capital money. We're doing this somehow without any of that, and I think that's awesome. In fact, one of our mentors, especially one of my personal mentors, uh, Alan Gunn, said this. He said, I want to help out Joomla because if you can succeed, there's hope for distributed leadership models of all types in the open source world. And I think that's really important. And I think that somebody like him, who's worked with a lot of open source projects, recognizes that there's something really special in our Joomla community. It's something very different. We're up there with the big guys, but we're doing it essentially without the one leader. And I kind of like that. I think that's kind of cool. And I think there's a way we can do this moving forward that's even more effective. Standing on the shoulders of those that came before us is often going to be very critical in uh, being successful and learning from the lessons and the histories of those that came before us and to share that with the next generation is really going to be important for us. And I wanted to just take a moment to think about and to show you the way that Joomla leadership has evolved. Because some of us here are old timers. In fact, who here has used uh, Mambo, came in from the Mambo days? All right, great. And then did anybody come here after Joomla 1.5 or during the 1.5 years? Yay, a couple of folks, good, excellent. So then let's just do a quick walk down memory lane. Uh, so remember this when uh, Mambo, uh, or when Joomla started in 2005, I think there was 27, 29 people assigned to be on the core team. Core team said, you know what we need to do? We need we immediately need to be able to start a foundation or a nonprofit, a place that we can put the intellectual property of the project and keep it safe and a legal entity. And that was open source matters. That's what some of us here today are a part of. So there's three members of that. And of course, open source matters, is, its only job was to focus on the legal and the financial, and the core team was supposed to focus on everything else with the intent and the purpose of saying, Let's keep open source matters weak, especially from a position anywhere outside of legal and financial, and the core team, the community, this crazy, headless project moving forward together in an amazing way, let's keep that strong and give it everything it needs to be successful. We move from that into a working group methodology. Was anybody here a part of one of the old working groups or a leader? Yes, great, two, three, perfect, excellent. Uh, so I get to tell the, I'll, I'll tell the story and then I'll tell what happened at the end. Uh, working groups were to have leaders, those leaders were to either be on the core team or working in conjunction with the core team. Which working groups were you guys a part of or that you remember? Um, Spending guidelines, uh, documentation, um, development, and yeah. Yeah, so they were like that. They were units of kind of the, the software building process and also infrastructure pieces as well. Uh, so the success of the working group model. Oh yes. Could you uh, could you describe how leaders selected in a working group? Is it ad hoc? Is it someone in the team? <laughs> I would say it was so pretty common? good. Good question, uh, honest. I would say it's, it was pretty ad hoc. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It was ad hoc. Ad hoc. Yeah. Like like a night. If you were at the right place at the right time. Right. You're chosen. <laughs> right. <laughs> or if you were the only one there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or if you were the only one there at the time. Yeah. Right. Oh, somebody's dialing in. That's awesome. <laughs> I left my motor at home. Um, success in the working group model. Uh, one thing, we had just a, an amorphous core team to start, and by having a working group model, it allowed for the larger tasks to be broken up into smaller tasks so we could focus on getting things done. Uh, it also provided uh, a leadership model, and the goal was to have a leader for each one of these teams that could be reporting back and contributing with the core team, that sounds all reasonable and good, uh, and it enabled us to hit some really key successes as a new project moving from the Mambo days and into the Joomla days. But what happens over time? 
Well, first of all, the Revolution Party ends and the hangover period begins. You know, we, we carried the new flag of Joomla in two, that late 2005, and then after some time, you're like, whoa, wow, the euphoria and the excitement quickly shifts to, we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, people start to realize that for the course of the past year or so, they forgot they had family and friends and children and jobs and other things to do, and that was good. <clears throat> people that were working and trying to stick to the process uh, were too busy on the stuff they were working on internally to be focusing on nurturing the next generation of leaders coming forward. And of course, uh, leaders needed to leave their responsibilities, but they already have huge workloads for the people they are trying to hand it off to. So you can see that this is spiraling down into a not so good situation. So some of the challenges that we saw as we shifted the way the project worked were one, as people left to go back to their family and jobs and other things they'd forgotten about, uh, there wasn't the backfill there for new leaders to come and help out. Uh, people started taking on way too many tasks, and folks that are parts of these working groups uh, can definitely, definitely recognize that, especially as some of the working groups just began to become very obvious and not move and not innovate. So simply put, this is pretty straightforward, there was a major burnout process that happened in the working group model. And the leadership team, or the core team at the time, recognized the need to make significant change. So some complicating factors for those of you that remember, there was a time that we had this amazing open source project that was led by a leadership team that had a closed mailing list that wasn't necessarily open to the public. Additionally, a lot of those key leaders have been around for a long, long time. That led to significant burnout, especially for those that needed to help fill the gaps by other leaders. Uh, and then, of course, in any open source project, there's just going to be interpersonal differences and challenges that people are going to need to face. And when you're under stress and you have different personalities, that makes it even more difficult to get things moving forward. Uh, so some wise words. Um, we've all seen an intense and immediate uh, meteoric rise for our little project and not necessarily been ready for the consequences of that rise. Uh, the ways of thinking and the organizational structures that made so much sense to us a year ago or so aren't getting the job done today and we know it. This was um, Lewis, Lewis and Andrew back in 2008 when this process was getting worse and worse. So they needed to simplify things into smaller structural groups. They needed to build teams rather than just individual roles. And they need to find a way to speak publicly and less on the private core team mailing list. So what was the result? A lot of you have seen this, but to continue to drill it in, a production leadership team, a community leadership team, and open source matters, building out and rounding out a really significant change in the leadership model of the project. From a lot of working groups that were dying off and becoming inactive to three key leadership teams. So, Part of what we saw in open source or in OSM world, and what I want to be talking about from a leadership perspective, is some significant changes. So first of all, as you folks may remember from last year, we really focused the last year on three core principles within OSM. These are our leadership guidelines for last year. They're going to continue to be our leadership guidelines for this next year. And that's transparency, empowerment, and accountability. If we can keep hitting those key goals, we can continue to move forward, I think, in a much more uh, uh, successful manner. So some of the things that we did, we did some novel things, like asking for feedback from our other leaders and other teams, and say, what are we doing right, and what could we be doing better? And I hope that other teams in our project will continue to do the same. We also recognize that we're not always right, and that we've made mistakes. We've oftentimes apologized for them, we've oftentimes recognized we need to do better, and just recognizing that we're not always right is important, and I want to continue to see that happen in leadership. Uh, setting very large goals and recognizing that if we can say we want to make a dent in the universe, we want to be able to change the way people solve problems, whatever it is that we want to do for us <coughs> as a community, we need to continue to set that as leaders moving forward. Getting coaching. Uh, providing professional feedback from folks that have been there, done that, having advisory boards is important for us moving forward as leaders. Um, so now I get into some of the things that I've seen happen 
that I think are really important to us. Some of the things that I think are happening behind the scenes that might, maybe not all people know about. Um, first of all, I've really learned, and I know that Phil, Andy, and others have recognized in our leadership team that communications is key to everything that we're doing. I've just seen this last couple of days that a lot of what may be perceived as not working out well or could be better, or you're doing a great job, but it's oftentimes the result of poor communications. And that people really are trying hard to do the best they can. And the more we can communicate with each other and have opportunities to meet together are really, really critical for our success. Um, onboarding new O, S, which would be this, S, M leaders and others uh, is not easy. And I say that with direct uh, knowledge and, and recognizing that I know Phil, I know myself and others have very clearly asked, we need this, we need these, these three people to be filling this position, we need this very specific uh, help here. And oftentimes it's, it's not there. And to find the right fit sometimes just, just takes some time. Uh, so recognizing that, and that it's not easy to just bring in new people with a snap of the fingers is important for us. Uh, we've oftentimes seen that when folks try to do too many things at the same time, which is very easy to do, especially in the leadership of a huge project like Joomla, uh, we start to lose focus. Uh, we start to lose direction, and we're not as effective as what we're doing. So one of the things we do at OSM is to find ways to keep people, uh, I'll say on task, but that makes it sound like it's a job, to keep people focused on the things they're most passionate about so that others can take on the other parts. Yes? You were talking about T and the A of accountability. If this situation occurs within the current leadership structure and everything underneath that, how do you solve it? What happens to avoid this and how do you account somebody, uh, so hold somebody accountable for something right. when you're not paying them? Right. So it's right for the yeah. Can we, I have some other things to say that kind of lead to that, but well, let's ask that again if you can send out an answer. Well, oh, okay, sure. Clicker not working. Uh, there we go. Uh, so those of us in OSM world, in fact, people in the community leadership team and others, recognize that building systems that are easy to use and simple to manage are really important for us. Um, and of course, oh man, I've got a couple slides to see my photos. Imagine a beautiful photo here that by 30 in the morning disappeared. Uh, all good things are taking time. I think we recognize that, especially in the leadership process, that unfortunately, especially with this huge Joomla ship and a massive user community, <coughs> It takes us time to move forward on things. We recognize that we can be doing things faster and we try to, uh, but we also hope that we can have some patience in moving forward on these things. <coughs> Click are going away. Uh, all right, lost photos, okay. Uh, the teams are managed differently. So there's a community leadership team, there's a production leadership team, and there's an OSN. And I think folks might not know that they're managed very differently. Uh, it's been interesting because in OSM, when I became president last March, we had almost immediately thereafter a 90% shift in our board members. And I won't say that I became president and then 90% of the project just, or the, the leading team just left. I hope I didn't smell too bad, or people didn't like me. Uh, but we had new members of our team that were here today and others that were joining as new people, as older people were, were moving. It was kind of a, a moving of um, players on the, on the chessboard there. But because of that, uh, I came in with a real desire and a focus to say, finding ways to document what we're doing, finding ways to empower people with leadership roles and to give them tasks, and to measure their success, and to have an open way to communicate, you know what, you're doing a great job, or you know what, you're not at where we expected you to be. Are you sure you want to stay in this role? Maybe there's something else for you to do. That's really critical, and that is novel for us in the Joomla project. In the production leadership team, or in the CLT, especially in the production leadership team, if you ask Lewis, there is not one person who has a president's role in the production leadership team. And the same thing with the CLT. And to me, that's, that's interesting. You know, for them to get stuff passed and move forward, it's a heavy and strong consensus building process. 
that everybody needs to agree on something before moving forward. That doesn't mean that everything is a huge process. Sometimes it's just, do you agree? If you don't agree, say no, we're moving on. Um, but oftentimes it means it's a lot different than having an executive who's setting the vision and a team that's working together to define that vision and moving forward and making a decision. If you don't have that, it's just going to be different. And I would say oftentimes it might take a little longer if you have an executive saying, we're moving in this direction. And that executive can be changed every year, which is exactly what we have in, in OSM. So definitely recognize that OSM is very different from PLT, and PLT is very different than CLT. Another, gosh, oh, here comes what is next, okay. Uh, so have a problem, provide a solution. Uh, there's lots of times where people see problems either in the community, in the leadership, and where we're going, and find time to complain about it, which I can understand that's good, people need feedback, uh, but what I've seen most effective in motivating leadership to change, if folks in this room are interested in seeing leadership change, is to find ways to recognize problems and also provide solutions. The solutions don't need to be perfect. These can be experiments that we can try out. These people are, are we're human. We're trying to find ways to do things better. But it's much easier when you've got all these other tasks that you're doing and you have a job and you have a family, if somebody sees a big problem, to say, hey, and here's a couple of ways I think we might be able to solve something. And it was awesome to hear that one of the unconference sessions out there yesterday, the, the first one out of there, in the main auditorium, pretty much hit something like this. It said we recognize some challenges. We recognize communication challenges. We recognize we want to innovate faster. And people out there said, well, let's, let's talk about that. Let's find a way to solve that. It wasn't just an hour or two of, we're frustrated. It was an hour or two of, we're frustrated. Let's find some solutions out there. And let's provide them back to the leadership. And I want to encourage folks to continue to do that, because I think that is effective in making change. <laughs> I also think it's important for us to be moving to voice communication. I know it's <coughs> difficult in a multicultural, multinational community. But when there are challenges, the faster we can stop writing emails and stop using Twitter and stop using Skype and get on the bloody phone or on voice Skype and say, hey, friend, this is a problem. Let's talk about this. What do you think? And if you're lucky enough to meet at an event, grab that person and say, let's have a drink. Let's talk. Because too often I see the flame wars on Twitter, and it frustrates me. And I know it frustrates you, and it frustrates other leaders. So let's find some ways to solve that by taking it offline and having one-on-one -on -one conversations. And sometimes that's tough. Sometimes it's hard to get those people connected. But let's really focus on making that happen. I also think it's really important to recognize, especially for me, especially for others on our leadership team, uh, that life, uh, family, friends and others come before Joomla, period. I think that's the way we all should be thinking about life. Joomla is a part of our lives, but Joomla is not our lives. Especially when we're getting very passionate about things, we're trying to move forward on tough problems. We've got to recognize, you know what, especially leaders, especially folks in the community that are very passionate about what they're doing, we've all got other things we need to do as well. Let's be patient. Let's recognize that people have a lot going on and find ways to solve problems together. So one last slide, I know we're running short on time, um, but please stay afterwards if you can. Um, this is all a, a big experiment, folks. Like, there aren't many other projects that we can look at and say, that's where Joomla needs to go, we're just like that. This is really novel, this is something different. And we're trying to do this without saying, there's one leader that's going to tell us every day, every week, every month, this is where we're going, this is what we must do. We're trying to do that as a community. We're trying to do that through a distributed leadership model as well. Maybe that's not the right way to go. Maybe we decide as a community in a year, you know what, we just need a benevolent dictator to come in and tell us what to do. We need a corporate overlord to come in and give us billions of dollars of money to just change everything and to make this a great corporate project. But I don't buy that. I think we've got something really special here. And I know that it's tough, and I know especially the last two years 
has been somewhat painful for folks that are very passionate about where we're going and what we're doing. But I'm very, very hopeful that with eight years of experience as a team together and a community together, and looking forward with all the great tools we have and the opportunities we have as a community moving forward, that we can be doing this uh, as a team. <coughs> so thank you all. And I do want to take time to answer questions. I do know that it's 10 o'clock now, is that right? Um, so I know we started late. If there's folks that want to stay, I really would love to entertain questions because we have leaders in the room here. And we now have four or five of us in the room here from OSM. Uh, and it would be great to answer some, some thoughts or questions. But if you need to leave, please, please go. I'm not going to hold you back from checking out late. Uh, but thank you guys all for your time. Does anybody have any hard-hitting questions? Especially, I know you had, a, you had a comment. We can start with that one if you want. Yeah, I think it was a question about how you hold people accountable and how you can solve uh, problems when you see somebody in your team who is taking on too many things and not putting life and family, as you say, in front. Yeah, I'm basically getting a burnout, which results in the projects that made it. Right. Yeah. That's my interpretation of what's been going on for a while, and I'm just your average user uh, following on the sideline, just hearing the gossip, right. not hearing a clear message, message from the board saying, no, that's not the case. Yeah. So the, the question is, how do we make sure that we recognize that there's burnout and help people that are getting burned out and, and seeing what change needs to happen because of that? Uh, and for other board members in the room here as well, please feel free to, to chime in if you have uh, ideas. One, I think just recognizing that people are burned out and to have them in a safe spot be able to say, you know what, like, you're not just making bad mistakes, you're not making these things because you're a bad person. It's because, you know, it takes, maybe you need to take some time, take a break. Uh, I know lots of people in leadership, especially at the 2008 summit, uh, had said, you know what, I, just, I, I wish I had somebody to just pick up the phone and talk to. We're all so busy, we're all separate, we don't work together in the same place. Opening that communication, I think, is the first step. Um, the second step is just continuing to find new blood, to find new people to come in, to, to be that backfill for the next <coughs> generation of the project. Um, and I think folks, especially on um, all of our teams, production leadership team, the CLT, and even OSM need to focus more on, on doing that so we can be ready to groom that next generation moving forward. But to do that, we need to set them up for success. We need to have specific mentoring roles. We've got to have basic tasks for them to do and a path to move into those important roles. The project's too big to not have that these days. So, well, yeah, can, can I just sort of add to that? Um, I think I'm a little bit of an example where I came on to um, OSM October last year, and I thought, me, myself, I was going to change the world, I was going to get all, all this sponsorship money, etc., etc. Um, come sort of Christmas, January time, uh, I just realised what I'd taken on. I've got a family, I've got my own business, and I'm now taking on this OSM role, uh, you know, looking at sponsorship and all, all the rest of it. So I got to the point where I could not cope with this by myself. So I'm now changing where I'm trying to create a team below me. All right, so I'm more of a leader of that rather than a doer of that. Okay, so that you know I, I can bring people into my team, um, looking at sponsorship and partners and all that sort of stuff within OSM, which is great because I'm going to be there for two years if I'm lucky. Okay, and uh, and that really gets a couple of people in in place who who maybe then can take my role moving forward. Um, but you know I, I think that's the same in, in other areas where you know um, we can't do everything. Ryan can't run the whole of OSM, that's why we're there to help him. Uh, you're, you're talking about something unique and something special, the whole Joomla idea, it hasn't been done before, but all the issues you're talking about are everyday management business issues. They are solved by Microsoft or any company, my own company, even if it's you know, one person thing, we run into the same issue. So being unique and having a unique vision like Joomla doesn't mean don't run into the same problems, and there are solutions for it. Yeah. I, 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 family and life comes first, is your life. Okay. I think that family and life works best if you keep to the rhythm 
And one of the big holes in the routine things that Joomla should have, I think, is that it doesn't appear to have a rhythm. <coughs> you just have to stand around and wait, and then all these goodies come out of the sky. It would be really quite nice. I'm not suggesting that you should impose timescales. You will produce this by. Mm -hmm. But there should be a conversation that says, once a week, once a month, whatever the period chosen is, OK, I've now got 60% down the path. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, and I think that's smart, and I think that's some of the things we're doing at OSM are leading to that. Uh, the one thing I would say is, especially from the core team or the production leadership team mentality, for nine years, ten years, that wasn't the case, at least eight years, that wasn't the, the case. So we're trying to change a lot of the way people have been doing this for a long time. Um, and so I, I think those are all important to, to hit. I think that might be a slow process moving forward. Faster and better, but families change slowly. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, a solution proposal that I have been seeing at uh, Swisscom, large organization. Older managers have a mandatory holiday of three to four months every two to three years. They have to take those vacations. They have to go away, mm -hmm. leave the room open, uh, closed during that time, uh, get with their family, take a new perspective on their lives. When they come back, they are relaxed. They are not uh, in uh, burnout anymore. Right. And they take, take things much more easy than when they left. And it looks like it works out pretty well for them. <laughs> I like that. I, I like that idea a lot. And if we can set processes that lead to that, it's not just one day somebody says goodbye and drops everything and, and runs away. That would be too. That's, of course, that's I mean, they prepare that. Right. They, the interesting thing is that they have to leave their position to somebody else during that time. So they don't stick to their position when they come back. Right. They can take that position, they can take another position. They usually take another position because they have another perspective. Right. And that would be relaxing a lot of the shuffles and stickings. That's right. The teams that we are experimenting in Luna right now. That's good feedback. I can, I can bring back to the leadership. IBM have pastoral managers. They have people who are not, you know, that they work with the sponsorship team. They're not involved in getting the sponsorships. They're not actually doing that work, but they are embedded in the team and they look to see that guys aren't falling to bits mm -hmm. and maybe take some proactive steps to help. Mm -hmm. Just to pause, is there another session waiting to come in here? Yes. Yeah. Oh, in five minutes you start? Yeah. Wow, okay. Uh, if people still want to ask questions, I'm happy to just go outside of this, this patio here. This is a real opportunity to just get us the hard questions. We're happy to answer them and just to take feedback back to the rest of the leadership. So we're here, we're open, and we've got big ears like mine to listen. So thank you guys for asking. Thank you.